wow, this is, you, you, you should all come up here and see how bright this is. It's, uh, it's really hard. I'm, I relied on being able to haul a few people out of the group to uh, see who was here, but I'll, I'll, I'll judge by laughter who is out there. Um, so this is, this is a really special day for me. It is right up there almost with childbirth, but I've had two occasions with that. So this is really my only chance at, uh, at this sign-off, this, this farewell lecture that, uh, that Dr. Mummery has set up for the faculty. And it really is, it's been very hard packaging this uh, final farewell. And, but I do want to really give a strong thank you for a remarkable and memorable 23 years of serving in the faculty. Um, over this time, I've served under four deans. In fact, Carrie and I were just talking about that when we were coming over from lunch. I have met some incredible friends and developed some wonderful relationships and colleagues. And certainly, I stopped counting, but I know I've taught thousands of students um, and my most important lesson, I think, that I'm going to leave is captured by a quote by Winston Churchill. And probably is always an indicator of how old we are when we pull up quotes of uh, people in our past, saying, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And I think that really summarizes not only kind of who I've been in this faculty and what I am pathologically excited about leaving and continuing to contribute towards making Canada a better place for sport and physical activity. So I wanted to start a little bit with about sort of where I've been because I think this helps explain perhaps some of the, the story that I'm going to tell you today. And up in front of you, you will see these are the institutions that I've been at either as a student and most recently um, as an employee of the University of Alberta. So starting first of all, I was at the University of Ottawa, and that's where I did my first undergraduate degree in physical education, and then moved on to Western Ontario. Um, so from the University of Ottawa, I was absolutely smitten by teaching. And so after that, I was convinced, if you can imagine this, that I wanted to go back to my own high school in Ottawa and become a phys ed teacher. That was my passion. And that's what took me to the University of Western Ontario the first time to undertake a year of teacher's college. Uh, and that was where I was fondly introduced to the sport of rowing. So my teaching career at high school got a little bit sidetracked. And while I was then teaching, uh, pardon me, while I was training with rowing down in St. Catharines, a short hop, skip, and a jump from Hamilton, I became a sessional at McMaster University. And, and in my naivety, I thought, oh my goodness, I love teaching here. What degree do I need now? And was quickly told that I needed a PhD. And I thought, OK. <laughs> and uh, that was quite a journey. So through my McMaster days, and then I ended up returning back to Western for what I call a quasi-postdoc, and then landed back at the University of Alberta, where leaving Ontario was one of my best decisions, since that my husband and myself are extremely fond of the outdoors. So what did I know about myself? Well, I knew I loved to be active. I loved, I was terribly competitive. Um, I knew that I was, uh, was very keen on teaching, and I wanted to keep teaching. And there was something about being in that university environment where there was this constant demand for learning. And I loved that. I loved being able to continue learning while teaching others and being able to communicate some of the things that I had thought were very special. Through my undergraduate days and on into graduate school, I was starting to learn about the female athlete. And this was one thing that clearly intrigued me because I felt at the time it was a bit self-serving. I was learning about myself and how historically opportunities for women to be physically active or to be able to be involved in competitive sport were extremely limited. So then along comes Title IX, 1972, which was a US Educational Amendment Act. And this was then starting to establish a permanent line in the sand, suggesting that every girl and woman be provided the equal opportunity, equal financial support to be involved in sport. 
Since then, there was the trickle-up effect into Canada, and we know that as a result of this, among other initiatives, has led to changing participation rates and with more and more women engaged in rigorous training. As a result of this, it was becoming increasingly clear that there were some very unique responses to regular physical activity, training, and competition. There was a very small editorial, and this was one that piqued my interest when I first started grad graduate school, and this was one of the very early responses which was described in a, in a tiny, tiny editorial in Lancet back in 1978. And this was showing the relationship between increasing uh, running weekly mileage shown on the lower axis and the percent of women with fewer than three menstrual cycles in the previous months. So these early reports suggested there was something to do with being engaged in exercise or training that was responsible for these menstrual cycle irregularities. So my life as a graduate student, surprisingly, I, I don't know how I ended up in a steroid biochemistry lab. I was a physical education grad with an aim to teach at a high school, but again, I wanted the PhD and this is what I needed to do. In hindsight, it would not be at all the same kind of advice I would give to grad students seeking a place to train. Hence, it's where I learned all about the reproductive system and its regulation. As reports of amenorrhea grew in the literature, some were reporting that amenorrhea was occurring upwards of 50% in some sports. And there were all kinds of factors being examined as possible underlying mechanisms for loss of menstrual function. But at this time, this, there was very, very little worry about the consequences of amenorrhea. In fact, as I was doing some surveys through graduate school, whenever I would talk to female athletes about the loss of their menstrual cycle, it was nothing short of like a single knee drop, a big fist pump saying, yeah, who, who needs it? It became this quite intrusive event that they could do well without. And so what if it was transient infertility? Most female athletes weren't looking to get pregnant and have a child at that point anyway. Some very foolish women thought that actually amenorrhea was a really good form of contraception. Some were a little bit surprised later on that perhaps they couldn't understand how they got pregnant. So I often say to people, don't ever trust amenorrhea as being a bulletproof fashion of contraception. So in my PhD work, again, we started looking at numerous hormonal changes in amenorrheic athletes compared to the normally menstruating or eumenorrheic athletes. And I latched on to this thing about beta endorphins. And at the time, this was being claimed as the natural painkiller. You know, go out and run, and people are looking for that natural high. Uh, but my own studies actually found no difference between any of these groups of athletic women Although, even though they were altogether higher, they were not really telling of that story at all. So fast forward, after this short kind of quasi-postdoc at the University of Western Ontario, I was uh, graciously hired by this faculty and started in the summer of 1991. At the time, my husband, Paul, and my six-month-old son, Jordan, along with our cat, who is no longer with us, moved out to Edmonton to begin our careers in Alberta. And moving here, as I said earlier, was such a no-brainer for us to leave that very, very busy corridor in Ontario. We both loved the outdoors, and being a short three-hour drive from Jasper was a dream come true. So I stepped into the typical 40-40-20 position. And this is where I continued to look at the female athlete and some of the reproductive findings. And over the years, the literature has really started to clarify, is this a phenomena that we need to worry about? Does it really matter that female athletes are amenorrheic? And the other part of it is the literature has now advanced that we actually have a very good understanding about what is happening. So I show for you on this slide the energy balance scale. So it really had nothing to do with the exercise itself, but it had to do was the energetic demand of the exercise being adequately replaced through energy intake. And when that energy intake did not meet the training demands, the energetic demands, then one of the processes in the body that started to become compromised included the menstrual cycle. 
And this actually made sense, is that the body's quite smart, is that when fuel is in short supply, that a process such as the menstrual cycle or maintaining reproduction was not considered as imperative for survival of the organism. So again, when energy supply was limited or hard to come by, then reproductive function and all of its very energy consuming processes, making hormones, developing an egg, thickening the endometrium and so on, those started to become blunted. And when they became blunted, where the arrow is pointing, is that this very important hormone, estrogen, would start to decline. And this is when we then have compromise to bone health. And this is where, in about 1992, the American College of Sport Medicine coined the phrase, the female athlete triad. So these three phenomena then were intricately linked through energy balance, the reproductive function, and bone mineral health. And this has become a fascinating area of study. One particular uh, area in response to what I'm calling a, an energetic insult to the developing female athlete is understanding as the young girl is growing that about, we see here in this slide as the numbers increase from one to nine on the lower axis, this is showing increasing irregularity or complete absence of the menstrual cycle. And on the y-axis showing bone mineral density declines in a very tight relationship. So the more irregular the menstrual cycle, the more bone mineral density suffered. This was particularly important when we think about these young developing female athletes where 90% of their peak bone mass being attained by 18 years of age. This becomes a critical window of obtaining or the opportunity for oppor for optimizing bone health. So if these young female athletes are amenorrheic, then their peak bone mass is also being seriously compromised. And this has huge implications, not only for their life as an athlete, but what will their bone mineral health be when they become late in later decades in their 40s and 50s. So then, carrying further, one study, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the studies which have uh, not only helped me understand this, but have also been this incredible vehicle to find and work with new people, not only within our faculty, but across campus. So in addition to the bone health being compromised, I started to question, well, were there other systems that could suffer as well in the amenorrheic condition? And this was one study, and this was thanks to Stu Peterson, who introduced me to magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And when Phil Chilibeck, from, currently from the University of Saskatchewan, came and did his postdoc here before launching into Saskatoon, this was a study that we looked at around what happens to the muscles and the ability of muscle to recover based on the condition of amenorrhea. And this is where we found that the normal enhancement that we would find in athletes about an, an expedited recovery was actually blunted in these amenorrheic athletes. So we were starting to put together some pieces that were important for the practical application for the female athlete. We wanted to try and examine this in a more regular model. And I remember there was a few years when I was working with George Foxcroft, Foxcroft over in animal science, and we were trying to develop something in a working pig model. And the number of jokes which came out around how do you make a pig amenorrheic um, you can imagine where some of those jokes might go. So um, I was also really fortunate to uh, be given access to the psychiatric inpatients in the anorexic ward, uh, fourth floor over in, um, in the hospital. And this too was a huge learning experience where uh, I had to supervise the, the patients coming over here to have some tests run. And they were fascinated, and again, one of my biggest lessons was we weren't allowed to do a VO2 max test on them because of, of clinical limitations. We did get approval to do a physical work capacity test up to a heart rate of 170, but what I quickly found was that when many of the patients stepped onto the bicycle, they wouldn't want to get off, and they wanted to keep going and going and going. And I felt awful, I thought, 
what's going to happen? You know, someone's actually going to perish in my hands. And so I learned very quickly. I mean, I just needed to tighten the wheel of the bike and say, your day is done here, and now I have to escort you back. But again, it was, a, it was quite insightful um, to which this kind of condition, which the female athlete in its extreme can lead to some of those very serious and devastating eating disorders. Through this pathway, I was then uh, introduced to a colleague, Linda McCarger, and Catherine Field and Rhonda Bell over in Nutritional Science. And working with them and through their grad students, again, I was always so delighted when they were very generous, not only with their time and their expertise, and it was becoming very clear to me that when I was engaged in the research projects, that it was equally important for me to have a good hypothesis and as powerfully important to be working with good people. And I know we all have different definitions of good people, um, but they were, they were marvelous. And then to actually have a hand in the development of grad students was something that I was very happy about. Moving closer to in the faculty, uh, a number of projects, again, through the collaboration with people like Wendy Rogers, Carrie Kernier, um, Dan Seertuck, uh, along with their grad students. And, and I know Gord Bell isn't here today. He's down at ACSM, I hope basking in the sun in Orlando. Um, but Gord Bell, um, he's, he's been one of the most extraordinary people in my life. And I coined him a long time ago as being my well-being factor, that Gord was one of the reasons I came to work. Uh, he was always there, as many of you know, always with that open door. And uh, yeah, I, uh, Gord, in fact, one time when Gord and I were over in the earlier East Wing, and I found out he was moving offices, and it was, it was down then into the Pavilion Wing, and we were, we were office mates. We were right next door to each other. And I felt so hurt that he wouldn't come and tell me that he was moving. And I said, where are you going? And he said, I didn't know how to tell you, but I've, I've got the corner office with some lovely windows. And I thought, how could you do this to me? You know, you're going to make me walk all the way over to find you. And so lo and behold, at the time, Marsha Padfield was leaving. And so I, I think Ed Montgomery just ha probably has serious memories of me hunting him down, saying, OK, can I have this office down here? Because then I can get close to my buddy Gord Bell. So Gord, again, was one of those over and above generous people with his time, his energy, the kinds of conversations that we have ranging well beyond teaching students, uh, engaged in research, and never being shy to ask what some of us might think are silly questions, and always being honest with our work. I've also been very fortunate to work uh, with people out of what was originally called the Rick Hansen Center when Bob Steadward was still there, and now called the Steadward Center, and working with spinal cord injured individuals. And Justin Jeon, who again, some of you may recall, who's now over back home in South Korea, boy, Justin just would never, ever accept uh, any type of work that was less than top-notch. And I learned from Justin. Uh, Justin and I, I mean, he taught me a whole new level of patience around getting to a point where he wanted to be. And that's where I, got, I started to get a sense of, this is a student who is leading me. There is one particular article that I wanted to draw, and I, I actually I still get requests for this one. And this was with Tina Wong, my master's student, some time ago. And this is when we were comparing uh, lean compared to obese men. And the reason this one really stuck with me is we often think about all of the perils of obesity. And one of our most common messages that we give to individuals who are trying to uh, lose weight and maintain that weight loss is the effect of exercise on them. And again, thinking that exercise is a wonderful um, activity for them to engage in. And by all means, it is. But what this work showed to us is that some of the responses to a standardized bout of exercise between a group of lean and obese men were different. And they were different, not only based on the hormones that 
uh, that, were, that responded to this bout of exercise. But in particular, we found that this so-called fat burning zone, or the ability of the body to oxidize fat after exercise was diminished in obese men. And this was quite alarming. Uh, and so in my classes, um, in my PEDS 334 class, my body composition, nutrition, and physical activity, there was never any uh, pun intended or any type of joking saying, please, please never let yourself get overweight or obese because there are some of the metabolic findings that we, sh that we see going on that make it very, very difficult for you to lose it. So Tina, again, still keeps in touch, and um, she, again, I think, was uh, overwhelmed with the kind of work, but I think she was terribly proud when she got this paper out in, uh, in this journal. Other notable experiences um, I have had in our faculty, and this was very difficult for me to identify what were some strong stories to share with you today. But certainly is my uh, being given a bit of an open door and invitation to work with some of our coaches and their athletes. And I always felt very strongly about being able to translate the science, some of the findings around female athlete energy intake, implications for performance, and being able to transfer those findings to put them into meaningful practice uh, and uh, substantial advice for them. And that has been very rewarding for me to be able to do. This little icon that I have in here, and you might not be able to see it, but this poor uh, student has appeal written on their little piece of paper that they are carrying while they are hobbling along on a set of crutches. Um, this was one particular committee that I served on for a while early in my time in the faculty was the Undergraduate Academic Appeals. And when I would sit around this table, I learned so much vicariously by the mistakes and omissions and oversights and dodges of others. I learned so much about how to prepare a strong course outline, what to say to students, and in particular, what not to say to students. Um, I learned you never make a promise to a student about something that you are not guaranteed is going to happen how to build strong assignments, a very strong marking key. And the hardest part, and I, had, I got better with this over time, but to be able to have very honest conversations with students that need to be told that their work is not adequate. Many students who ended up around the appeal table, we would often have that discussion that perhaps they had not been given this news early enough in their career. So, as time ticked along in the faculty, it seemed to me that some things were also becoming a little bit unclear to me. Things were changing, and again, this slide is intentionally blurry, saying that I know as I age, I still wear, I start wearing glasses now so I can read in front of me. Um, but perhaps that my vision of other things have become less strong over time. But don't you agree, haven't we all seen things change as time has gone by? And I wonder if all things have changed for the better. Of course, some things are terrifically better. Can you imagine being you know, a university professor or a grad student or working at the University of Alberta without a computer? I still remember days back in grad school when we would make slide presentations, when we were still dealing with letter set and making up each individual slides, taking a photo of it, mounting our own slides. Not nearly the quick turnaround. Um, positive changes. I love the accessibility to information. I think that feeds that voracious learner part of me. So getting articles online is fabulous. Although I do really miss going to the library. I often thought as when I was in grad school that was quite a sanctuary for me to go through browsing and cruising the aisles looking for the most recent publications. But are there some things that have changed, perhaps not for the better, such as this? And I don't know how many of you, if I saw the entire audience, I would actually ask the question now, you know, how many of you are parents? And this, I think, is speaking a little bit about what I've seen in the change in the student population over time. So the figure on the left, 
I know that this could have just as well been me coming home from grade school and coming home with less than stellar grades. It was the parents stripping the skin off my face with, you know, what is going on here? What have you been doing? And creating a list of things that now I would be banned by. And then fast forward 40, 50 years to the situation on the right. And I know that this happens. I see it happen. In fact, uh, with, with my human physiology course, the first year course that all of our students have to take, this has happened to me where a parent has contacted me, again, with a fairly aggressive tone around what has happened to their student's performance. I tell one story where a student wrote me an email from this same first year class. And the message read, uh, Dear Dr. Harbour, my parents told me the final exam was cumulative, but on the course outline, it says it is not. Can you please help? And, I, and I've learned how to respond to these, and we all know not to hit the send button immediately. But my first reaction, and I do have to, had to cleanse my brain from this one, and I said, dear student, it's time for you to move out. <laughs> that was the best way I thought I could help at the time. So, and, uh, and most recently, most recently, in my third year course, I'm coming into opening day and I'm looking at the sea of faces of 65 students and I'm scanning along, scanning along, and I see a face there and I go, hmm, that's not the average age of a third year student. I'm thinking, oh, okay, don't jump to any conclusions. Perhaps it's a student who's coming back, finishing their degree. And I also told myself, don't ignore that there's a strong physical resemblance to the young lady she's sitting beside. <laughs> so I waited for the class to, to finish, and I wanted to go up and just sort of suss it out. And lo and behold, the student introduces me to her mother. And I thought, oh, really? I've never had this happen to me before. And I don't know if any of you have had parents attend your class without being invited. And so I thought, how do I get around this? And so I thought, well, I'm going to wait and see if it happens again the next time. And so the, the mother did not return the next time. But I did ask the, the student. And I said, so that was your mom. Uh, you know, does she join you to most of your classes? She said, and very, very proudly, she said, yes, every year she will come to at least my opening class, and sometimes she will come back. So I was gobsmacked at that, to be honest. I thought, where is this detachment piece coming in? So I think maybe we can all reflect on stories um, around our engagement with students. This was a photo I took of my very last exam, again from PEDS 103. And in standing in the back of the main gym, I pondered about the number of times I have watched this very same view unfold. And knowing that this was actually my official last time. So standing there with Chris Seller, who is my colleague in this class, as well as, uh, as Joel Jackson, the grad student who was our TA, and just sort of being able to look around and seeing this um, very quiet piece. And I loved at the back of the gym being able to remind myself, uh, not only on that day, but as I always look at this around it, being the home of the golden bears and pandas, a wonderful place to be. Active Healthy Kids Report Card talks about, has active play become extinct? And I, it has taken a drubbing. And by robbing these kids of an opportunity to play freely without a lot of supervision, without a lot of structure, we now have evidence that there are enormous health benefits to simply free, unstructured, unsupervised play. Yes, perhaps at the risk of a few bruised knees, a little cut elbow, elbows, but there's also cognitive benefits that we are robbing these children of and social benefits. And when we talk about fun, when was the last time that any of you played where you got engaged in an activity 
where time became meaningless. And I'm not talking about in a casino where you're, you're blinded from light and time. But being able to do something for pure intrinsic value and reward. And this is where I plan to go because Canadian Sport for Life, when they invited me to write an article on the female athlete based on the work that I've done on behalf not only of where my grad student, but more importantly, where I was able to continue that work at the University of Alberta, they invited me to come and write an article. And when I learned more about Canadian Sport for Life, it lit a fire in me that was quite consistent with my desire to teach, my desire to learn. So Canadian Sport for Life is built on our three outcomes around physical literacy, which I'm sure many of you are starting to hear more about, and built on that very good platform of physical literacy, a wide range of movement skills in all kinds of environments, establishing confidence in children, having them to be motivated of their own volition to come back and play, compete, participate. Not that they've been arm twisted and browbeaten by parents. I mean, when and how can we get children to do that? And if we do that well, that does set the stage for high performance and that excellence pathway that very few individuals will ever, ever get a taste of. But most importantly, it will set the stage for being active for life. That has become an extremely compelling message for me. And in a world now where we all think, yes, being physically active is absolutely honorable, who is going to disagree with that? No one. And yet we seem to be quite adversarial in this quest to try and get there in a similar fashion. Can we possibly start working together? Can we truly, truly delve into collaborative actions to make these things come true? One example of this is trying to create training programs that are appropriate, developmentally appropriate, not bestowing adult type training programs on younger and younger and younger children, expecting excellence to come out almost as soon as they're dropped at the hospital and fresh born. So I often say, can we really start working together? Can we share resources as opposed to repeating them, duplicating them? And there is some extremely strong promise happening in this province of Alberta. I am so encouraged by the mindset of some people to come from very different sectors who really do want to start pulling on the same end of the rope, so to speak. So, despite enormous resistance, why am I possibly starting to dive into all of this very, again, sometimes contradictory, controversial, uh, trying to get sport to change the way it has its youngsters compete. I mean, any number of things will rankle people and put sand in their shorts to no end. It, I wonder to myself, how can it be so adversarial? And yet I believe so strongly in the impact of physical activity. And I believe so strongly in the impact of quality sport when well delivered. I feel like why can't I be a part of restoring the joy and value of sport and physical activity, particularly here at home in Edmonton and in Alberta? So you'll probably see me pulling the rope and encouraging people to come in and join me as we go through these uh, processes around getting people to think more about engaging physical activity, restoring free unstructured play, and any number of pieces and projects along the way. I'm not going anywhere, and in fact, I'm very excited about the sport development, the green and gold system, and I know Rob Kreps is here, so a shout out to you, Rob. I'm, I'll be pulling for you, literally and physically, when you need me. Uh, and also, I, I genuinely say this, if there's parts of projects that you would like help with this, I am here, and, and I really do want to do this work at home. It has been a wonderful place for myself, for my family to move to. Um, there is absolutely no regret in the decisions that I've made. So I thank you for coming today and sharing this final time with me. Thank you. <laughs>